Welcome to today's episode of the podcast. We are joined by Connor. How are you, Connor? Good. How are you, Christopher? Good. And in today's podcast, we'll be discussing the topic of vaccination. I'd like to start off with talking about the vaccines that are currently available. We have the Pfizer vaccine. We have the Moderna and Oxford University vaccines that have been approved for medical use in the UK. They are all above 90% effective. So to begin with the Pfizer vaccine, which was first approved for medical use in the UK in November of 2020, this vaccine offers 95% protection against COVID-19 and it must be stored in temperatures as low as minus 70 degrees Celsius. This means governments, medical companies and producers have had to store the vaccine in specially designed freezers. How do you feel about this, Connor? Uh, well, yeah, it's a very complicated feat for the government to to keep them in in such uh, cool conditions. But I think they've handled that uh, they're quite well. And I'm just glad that there's a vaccine at all. I'm not really worried about how how difficult it is to transport them on that. Agreed. So on the 30th of December 2020, the Oxford University vaccine was approved for use in the UK about a month after the Pfizer vaccine was approved, with the first doses being delivered on the 4th of January 2021. It also has a very high defence against COVID-19. I can't give you the exact figure. Uh, figure. It's around 90%, above 90%. I know that's what the defence is, but I can't give you an exact figure on that. The Culture Secretary, Oliver Doden, in a television interview stated that the vaccine would arrive in April and the UK government has ordered 17 million doses of this vaccine. It is 94.1% effective. You have to wait 28 days between your first and second dose, which is a drastic improvement. But as we know, in America, I think it was first approved, we had the Johnson Johnson vaccine. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that only requires one injection. It's a single dose vaccine. Indeed. So would you like to add anything onto that, Connor? Yeah, well, just just to say that I'm quite excited for the Johnson Johnson one, and I hope that it's gets approved in the United Kingdom pretty soon because I think it will definitely be one of the, the, the better ones as given that it's just a single dose. It definitely is because we see in that waiting time between the first and second dose, it, it's quite extensive. I mean, my grandmother got the first dose and I believe that was in the start of January, uh, if I'm correct. And I, I know either the start of January or the start of February, I think it was February. And she has to wait until later this month to actually get the second dose, which it is quite an extensive period of time in between. Uh, So the Johnson Johnson vaccine definitely removes that time in which people can still, you know, catch COVID and suffer the consequences. Yeah, I know what you mean. It's a a 10-week waiting period between the first and the second dose, you know, because my my, uh, my mum works for the NHS and so she was, I think, in the the second um, group to get the vaccine and she had to wait 10 weeks between her first and second shot. And my, my grandmother's going through a similar position. So it is a very long wait. And I hope that Johnson & Johnson vaccine will hopefully just get the UK back to back to sort of normal quick, uh, quicker than the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccines. Connor, would you like to run us down in some of the figures of currently how many vaccines have been administ- uh, administered? Yes. So as of um, right now, Thursday, the 1st of April, 2021, the NHS has administered 4, uh, 4,108,000 506,000 vaccines, and those are people who have received two doses. The people who have received one dose is 30,905,538, uh, which is 5.76% of the population. Uh, I don't have the exact number, but it, I believe the UK is in the top 10 countries who have administered the vaccine. Of course, Israel leading the way on 52% of the population. The United States are on about 22%. I believe uh, Saudi Arabia are on about 7%. So it is good that the UK is doing quite well so far in administering the, the vaccine. Around the 15th to the 20th of March, the UK had really effective vaccine rollout. In fact, on the 20th of March, the, it, it peaked up 752,308 vaccines delivered on just that one day. But after that, it's sort of, it, it has slowed down a bit and it's been roughly 200 to 350,000 in, in, uh, in those days following that. I'm aware that in America, it was 10 million every two days, I think, was it? Uh, something around that, which is obviously incredible. And 
or 10 million, 10 million a week, it possibly was. Well, anyway, I, I knew a few weeks ago that the UK was 28 per second, I believe it was, which I think roughly estimated into what you were saying there, uh, 600 to 700,000 a day. The UK government definitely have very large ambitions for the vaccination rollout. The government, as you already know, has have laid out a path forward out of this crisis. Yes, they have indeed. And uh, I think the, the next group that are going to be targeted are people over 50. And they, they are the sixth or seventh group to, to, to receive the, the vaccine. Of course, it started with residents and care homes, and then uh, people over 80 and health and social care workers, people 75 and over, people 70 and over, and people 65 and over, and then people between the ages of 60, 16 and 64 who have health conditions that make them very vulnerable to COVID-19. And it is good to see them just continuously moving down the list and uh, checking, checking out groups. And so hopefully everything will be back to some some semblance for uh, normality pretty soon. I think that's what the government are really pushing for here. They want to get back to normality by the 21st of June so that the economy can open up again. People can get back out to their daily routine, going to restaurants or, you know, all these other sectors that have been closed for such a long, long period of time that will be opening up again. And that will most certainly have have a good impact on people's lives overall. And I think that's really the target the government have set out for, specifically because it's coming into them so, summer uh, months as well, which is just pretty good. And hopefully by that period, we can get enough people vaccinated so that herd immunity adequately kicks in. People are quite concerned about this target the government have set as we all know with government setting targets, most of the time they tend not to stick by them targets. Yeah, well, I think that the UK government has had a very, very poor COVID response and in, uh, in trying to contain the virus as well. But their, their their vaccine distribution has been really effective. And as you say, they have been quite bad at missing deadlines, like or even just saying something and then going against the other. I remember and doing something else. I remember uh, in late November, I believe, uh, Boris Johnson said there would absolutely not be a second lockdown, only to announce a, sec- a second or third lockdown just two weeks later. But I, I, I really hope that this is one that 21st of June, you say, yeah, yep. they, they, they can meet and stick to. I know it's the 21st of June for England. I'm unaware which date has been let out for Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales of Current, but I will check that out after. So vaccine hesitancy has been reported on quite frequently within the media. The Guardian reported that over 80% of people that were unwilling to take the vaccine in December have now changed their mind, which is great news. According to the Guardian, researchers tracked responses from over 14,713 adults in England and Wales and found that the change of mind was consistent across all ethnic groups and social deprivations which is also fantastic news that we can see this decrease in vaccine hesitancy. This will obviously have a very positive impact on our ability to achieve herd immunity. Any thoughts on that, Connor? I think it's just great news, and I'm so, so happy that it happened. I mean, even myself, um, after the the first vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine was approved, I was slightly worried that maybe it hadn't been worked on for too long. But I think that listening to Patrick Vellant and uh, the chief science officer and the chief medical officer of the, the United Kingdom, they've really put my like fears at ease. And uh, even looking over to America, Dr. Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, Fauci they've, they've really, um, I think, curbed a lot of fears from people who thought that maybe this had been done too, too, too quickly. But yeah, I think it is great news. And I, I, I look forward to the to after the fact where we see what has maybe brought, brought so, so many people into f- feeling positively towards the vaccines after. Uh, Dr. Parth Patel of uh, University College London was also quite relieved at this. He went on to state, and I quote, we were really sort of taken aback by the sort of magnitude of the shift. What we're showing is that vaccine hesitancy has changed. Everyone is pretty keen to take a vaccine right now. That doesn't mean disparities in vaccination rates will disappear. We're all aware that disparities will not disappear, but we're aware simultaneously that this decrease is very significant and it is incredibly positive for the rollout of the vaccine and confidence in government to properly administer this vaccine. Yeah, and I think possibly the, the NHS has quite a lot to do with that as well. 
they've had a very tough year, 18 months, and they, they, they've handled that quite well. And I think that the NHS has been promoting that vaccine and whatnots, and it, it has helped because it's such a well-respected institution. Just to go back to your point about the NHS, I, I think definitely above government in all of this, throughout the entire crisis, the NHS have worked incredibly hard. The, the people who have really made the largest impact are NHS staff and working class people who go out and do this job every single day, protecting people's lives and, you know, putting their own lives on the front as well. To a degree, you know, we really owe them a lot when it comes to this. They have went above and beyond in protecting communities and they've done a really great job and I would definitely put them above government in in this instance. Yeah, I I completely agree with that. 100% they've been phenomenal. They truly superheroes of the of the COVID pandemic, and I hope that they manage to get a, a good pay rise um, after, which will hopefully happen soon. I mean, I thought that the one percent pay rise was a complete mockery of people who have worked within the NHS for this year and years prior to this. Really, well, actually, really I, I hard. I believe on a that resource. That's, that one percent pay rise actually that. Um, like their first pay rise since 2010, I believe it was. And Labour said that g- given inflation and all, they'd actually lost money on it since since our last pay rise. And I think that they, they definitely deserve a massive, massive raise because, you know, going, going out and clapping for them, which happened about six, seven months ago, just wasn't going to do, do anything for them. It is not enough to go out and clap. We've seen Boris Johnson standing at 10 Downing Street clapping, but when it comes to actually giving the proper wage to workers when they deserve it, he feels there. And I believe it's just what he is doing when it comes to the clapping and his cabinet is really just tokenistic to me. Yeah, I completely agree. So the chairman of the Northern Ireland GP committee believes various factors, such as rumours on social media, could influence people in terms of fact, just vaccine hesitancy. I believe in particular social media and some very crazy rumours that have been thrown around about vaccinations in general, even before COVID, could especially affect young people's willingness to take the vaccine, which obviously isn't great. Some EU nations, as many have already known, have actually, or had actually, I'm not sure if they still have, had suspended, but had suspended the AstraZeneca vaccine due to some reports of the effects the vaccine may have had, although the World Health Organization have made it very clear that the reports are, are not necessarily linked to the vaccine itself. Yeah, I believe that the uh, European Union has once again started dissing out AstraZeneca vaccines. I believe that the, they have once again start, started using them again. And it was, I, th- I believe also part of that was due to a contract dispute between the EU and AstraZeneca regarding COVID vaccines, uh, in which the uh, European Union sent, sent an agreement uh, several months back saying that they, they would get more vaccines than, than AstraZeneca actually gave them. But I'm not 100% certain on that. We can see across the European Union that there actually currently is a second wave, which is not great at all, obviously. And um, I'm really hoping that this this will be the last wave because the vaccination program in the EU has actually been going quite fast, despite the multiple um, obstacles that have been in the way in terms of the suspension and so on. Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, have already said that their vaccination should be done by September, which is just great. Yeah, it absolutely is. And I think especially with the the nature of the European Union in which the the open borders between the the member states, that really um, the EU is not safe until every every country in the EU is safe. And so hopefully that hopefully uh, every every country can catch up to Ireland there uh, pretty soon. Yeah, hopefully, um, you know, most countries or every country within the EU can stay at the same level in terms of distribution. Obviously, there are much larger populations in certain countries, but that is the aim of many EU countries anyway. Uh, would you like to add any additional remarks on to that, Connor? You know, I just want to say that like, I just hope that the entire world is vaccinated soon. I know that President Biden, he, um, he purchased additional vaccines from uh, Pfizer, that uh, he he will share with less developed countries after after the Ameri- after the United States is fully vaccinated, and I hope that the world can move on pretty soon. I'd just like to say to um, conclude that these are incredibly difficult times for all of us, 
but to all the young people and those who have not yet received their first dose of the vaccine, I would strongly encourage you to take it when your time comes, of course, so that we can get back to some degree of normality and hopefully prevent further deaths and further families from suffering any longer. I know many people have their scepticisms in regards to the vaccine, and I'm not advocating that you must concede any scepticisms because of my views. Rather, you should consult with medical experts and your GP to alleviate any concerns or worries you may have in regards to the vaccine. I can tell you from my own knowledge that my family men- or many of my family members have been vaccinated and there has not been any adverse effects. So thank you for joining me and Connor on this week's episode of the podcast and make sure to stay safe and take care.